Luke chapter 18. And I want to remind us, if you weren't here last time, um, and if you haven't been here and are just visiting, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Luke, uh, starting around Christmas time with the birth of Jesus and working to uh, his death and resurrection that we're coming to here in a couple weeks. And if you will notice, there are 24 chapters of Luke, and a lot of them are pretty long, and there's really not a way to cover that entire book in that amount of time uh, and do it properly. So we kind of pick and choose. Uh, and every four years, we'll come back to the Gospel of Luke again and try to pick a few different things. Uh, and so we are skipping from chapter 15, where we were last time, to chapter 18, where we are today. Uh, but I think the two relate uh, in one way. Uh, last time, we looked at these parables of lost things, the, uh, the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. And I asked you then to, uh, to think about the different ways that they were lost and some of those things. But at the very beginning of chapter 15, uh, we noticed this, uh, that before he told those stories, it said the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes grumbled. And so you have these groups of people that are there to see Jesus, but they're there with different mindsets coming in. I appreciated that um, in Mark's class this morning, the idea of how the way we think about things and the way we interact with people changes things a lot for us uh, and how we may see the world. And so these two groups are coming to him in different ways. And so I asked the question last time, if you weren't here, do we listen or do we grumble? And if you're anything like me, uh, a pretty good deal of both, honestly. Uh, there are times where I get kind of grumbly. Uh, when I can't walk around with my little microphone on, I get a little bit grumbly uh, because there's too much feedback and I don't want to hurt your ears. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are times I want to listen, uh, and I want to listen to Richard, who knows the mic stand better than I do. Uh, there are lots of times where we come into situations, and do we want to listen, or do we want to grumble? And so Luke 15, at least from the audience perspective, was kind of about how are they coming to these stories? How do they hear these things? When we look at Luke 18, I think there's a little different thing that I want us to see, and we're going to try to see the whole chapter today, but I want, what, what I want you to notice is the people who are there. Uh, in each little story, and Luke 18 is kind of a series of little stories, we will be introduced to a new set of characters. Uh, and I think we will see something about them and something about what we can know about God based on how he interacts with them. Uh, and so uh, we'll look at Luke 18, and we'll start in verse 1. It says that after they t he told them a parable to the effect, uh, I'm sorry, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. Now, this is an unusual thing for when we find parables in scripture, usually you find this, this story and then you try to make sense of it. Uh, and sometimes you are just completely left to your own or to the church as maybe a group to try to make sense of what it says. Sometimes he will tell a story and then later in the chapter you will find him explaining, well, this is, this is what this means. You'll think of the parable of the sower, for instance. He tells that parable about the seed that falls in these different places and what happens. And then later on he says, okay, this is what it means. This seed is this and this seed is this. Here we have something unusual where he calls the shot at the beginning. He says, okay, this is what the parable is for. And so this parable is to teach us two things. First of all, always pray. Not when things get really difficult. Uh, not when you're at church and someone's up here with a microphone. Uh, not just at meals or just at bedtime with your kids or whatever it may be. Always pray in, in all things. Paul will say, you know, pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians. So regardless of the situation, we are to pray. And then secondly, don't lose heart. Don't give up. And for some of us, our tendency when things are just going wrong over and over again is to kind of think, well, it's just never going to be what I want it to be. It's never going to be okay. And so since I can't do anything about that, I'm just going to give up. Now, I think the fact that he's telling us a parable about these two things also teaches us, even though this is not just said outright, that these two things are related. So the idea of always praying may help us along the lines of not giving up. Uh, or the idea of never giving up will help us to realize, even if praying hasn't gone where I thought it would go, I'm going to keep praying. I'm not going to give up on that. So in verse 2, it says that in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. So what you have introduced here at the beginning is an unfit judge. <clears throat> now, you may find a judge that neither fears God uh, nor respects man in our culture today, and maybe you're not surprised by that. Uh, I won't ask Jack if he has ever encountered that in, uh, in lawyer and life. Uh, but there are times where we see that. But in Bible times, if you were to go back to Chronicles where it, it describes what a judge is supposed to be like, the first characteristic is they fear God. This is, this is who judges are. 
And so if you have a judge who doesn't fear God, so he doesn't have the ethic that God has built in, and then also doesn't respect man, so he doesn't really care about the plight of people, you don't have the judge you're wanting to be before. You, you have a judge that is not fit for that job. And then on the other side of the equation, in verse 3, it says there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. <clears throat> so you have this unfit judge, and on the other side, you have a persistent widow. And these two characters come to the story from very different places. And I imagine the judge sees this widow as just kind of, kind of an annoyance. And sometimes when we are in that position, it's easy for us to stop listening, or if we want to think in Luke 15 terms from a minute ago, to begin grumbling about that widow if we're the judge. Or if we're the widow, we may think, well, maybe I should just give up. There's no point in doing this. So it says that yet because this widow, sorry, verse 4, uh, for a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, he even knows he's a bad judge. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. There are a lot of times in this world we get the thing that we want, not because uh, of, of anything good that is going on with the people giving to us. They just kind of wear down somewhere along the way. So this judge, he wears down. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? So we have this unfit judge and the persistent widow, and we also find out something about God in this. He says, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now, speedily seems like an odd word to use here when we have this story of a widow who is persistently over and over again asked for the same thing. I would guess if you were to come to her and say, did this happen speedily, she would probably say, no, it didn't. But God's outlook on it is entirely different. So you have the the unfit judge and the persistent widow, but you also have in the midst of this a just God. God is going to see that his justice is done, but also in his timing. And to God, it seems speedily, even though to us a lot of times it seems kind of slow. And then he goes on in verse 9. It says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. We don't know anyone like this, do we? People that trust in everything of themselves and they feel like they've got it all together and they've got it all right. And because of that, they treat everyone else as less. Uh, I will let you in on something if you're a regular uh, church member who's here all the time. There are people outside of these doors that are confident this is who we are. Now, I don't think we are. I think I know you better than that. Although from time to time, I will run into some person in life that is like this. But I don't think this is who we are. Our world is convinced of it. And they see the Pharisee that we're going to see in this story as us. Uh, and they see themselves probably at the other end of the spectrum. But we are introduced to the idea that there are people who are like this, and if we're not careful, if we're not portraying the right thing, giving the benefit of the doubt, people may think this of us. So two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. Could you imagine if that was the prayer you heard in here this morning? Someone comes up to the microphone, let us pray. God, I thank you that I am not like all these other people who are here. What a mess they are. And thank you for how much I've got it together. I say that jokingly, and you laugh when you hear it. And yet, I have known so many people in church life over the years who have not been able to share their struggle with sin with a brother or sister because this is, even though we're not saying out loud, who they think we are. They think we believe that this is who we are. We've got it all together. Everybody else is a mess. Now, the beauty of this for us is I don't think most of us think this way. I, I hate that people get that impression. But the Pharisee here in the story thinks this way. So he is the Pharisee. And I will tell you, as I do every time we run across Pharisees in Scripture, when I read about them, each time I get a little more uncomfortable with myself than the previous time I read about them. Because I know I have some of those tendencies. I know there are times where I may look at someone and think, oh man, what, what a mess. Get it together. And then other times where I look in the mirror and I will think to myself, oh man, what a mess. Get it together. We, we all have these struggles. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have the tax collector. It says, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
So at the other end of the spectrum, you have a tax collector, and the way he is described is he will not even lift up his eyes to heaven. I haven't told you about our puppy in a while that's now a dog but still acts like a puppy. Uh, she still gets in all kind of trouble from time to time. And when you catch her on it and you use the tone uh, that Mark talked about in class that you're not supposed to use with people, and you say, Lucy, she will look down. Now, sometimes she will be defiant and bark at you uh, in return. But a lot of times she will look down because she realizes she's, she's done something. This is how the tax collector feels coming before God. And I will let you in on another little secret. I would imagine most of us, as together as you think someone else in this room has it, as much as you look to them as an example or think, man, if my life was more like their life, most of us have felt this way at some point. Some of us probably felt this way today. Some of you may feel this way right now sitting here thinking, I, you know, I just don't belong here. This tax collector comes before God and he recognizes who he is. And he recognizes he's not worthy, but none of us are, are we? Other than because God makes us, makes us whole. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so here we meet a God who sees the heart. You would see these two people coming before God, and if we could assume these prayers were silent for a moment, you would think to yourself, I wonder what that holy guy who knows Scripture so well he could just quote it all to you, who is keeping all the commandments, doing all the right things, I wonder what his prayer is like. And you may think, I wonder, wonder what the tax collector's prayer would be like. And God sees through all of it. All of us who try to have a fake image of who we are, and people see that, and, and hopefully they think we've got it all together, God knows what's real. And all of us who think we are worth much less than God really thinks we are worth, God sees that too. And so God sees through to the heart. So then they were bringing infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called, uh, to, uh, called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. So now we have children. And we all view kids differently, don't we? Uh, I have joked with you before that uh, I'm terribly frightened of small children sometimes, just because I don't know what to say. Uh, you put me in front of a group of teenagers, I may put them to sleep, but I can at least communicate. Uh, you put me in front of college students, it, it's okay for the most part. Adults probably more my wheelhouse. But when you put me in front of small kids, my wife better be there because she's the one who's going to get through and I'm just going to try to maintain control to some level. The disciples didn't have time for children. This is not what we're here for. We're here to do something else. And whatever we think of kids in our culture nowadays, and, and by the, all the jokingly, we, we love children at this church. Uh, and even though those who are frightened and know say all the time, we love the fact that there are kids at this church. Uh, we love the fact that on occasion, I'm about to make the most profound statement you have ever heard, and someone wails all of a sudden, and you don't hear what I said, I don't care. Uh, I'll repeat it to you later. You can come ask me, and I'll let you know what it was. I'm so glad the kid was there in the first place. We, we like kids here. And Jesus felt the same way. He said, let these children come to me. And then he says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And this is another of those things, like reading about the Pharisees, and I feel a little differently every time I read it. Every time I read this phrase, like a child, I see something different. And I think that's why we just have like a child and not a large description, because it's something different to each of us. Uh, I was the helper on occasion in the preschool class uh, during the last quarter. My wife was teaching. Thank goodness for them uh, that my wife was teaching, and I was just the helper. And I love the fact that she was, toward the end of the quarter, trying to teach them about, okay, we have the Bible. And in the Bible, you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so she would ask them, what, what are the two parts of the Bible? And they would say, that, first she'd start with, what's the book? And it's the Bible. And what, what are the two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament? And how many books are in the Old Testament and how many are in the New Testament? And somewhere along the way, in the midst of all the questions, 66 was the answer like 14 times, uh, not always to the right question. And as she would ask different questions in there, what I started to learn was if they did not know the answer to the question, which with preschoolers happens from time to time, if they didn't know the answer, every time it was one of three things, Bible, God, Jesus. Number four was 66, uh, which is either number of books or if you're a Star Wars fan, you know. Uh, it's, it's these things. And I think to myself, 
when did we lose when we don't know the answer to the question, it's either Bible, God, Jesus? Because it still is, even though we're grown-ups. And so when I see like a child, that's one of the things I start to hear now. When I see like a child, one of the things I hear is we, we have singing that comes from this area, at least until their pews are taken away, and then it might come from there, I don't know. Uh, we have singing that comes from this area that is, is louder than most, and you will hear it at some point during the course of a service most of the time. And I love it, but I also think to myself, why do you hear it at some point in the service most of the time? Because they are four or five people, and we are 200 and whatever people. We shouldn't be able to hear them, because we're not singing like they do. That's why we hear them. And I think to myself, when did we lose that? When did it all become about how well I know the song or what it sounds like or any of those things? How many times do, do we have people that just don't want to sing at all? And I think, like a child. And we could put a hundred things with it like this. Innocence or wonder or all of the different things that come with being a child. But Jesus said, unless you become like a child. So we have a God who values children. And to us nowadays, we completely get that. In their culture, that's not something that people that were worthwhile did. Children were to be seen and not heard and honestly probably not seen. And God here says, bring the children to me. So a ruler asked him in verse 18, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so we're introduced to, it says a ruler here at the beginning. If you've got the headings, it says rich ruler probably. Uh, and if you get further down in the story, we find out he's wealthy. So we'll go ahead and call him a rich ruler. And his question I don't know why he asks it. I don't know if he really wants to know. I don't know if he's looking for validation. But for whatever reason, he asks the question, what must I do? And so Jesus rattles off a list of things you need to do. Isn't it a glorious moment when you hear a list of things that you're supposed to do and you find out you're already doing them? Uh, isn't it great if you're a student when you get the study guide for the test and you see a list of things you already know? And you think, oh, this is, this is great. Or, or when you, your, your parents say, you know, we're going to have some rules. And here's what the rules are going to be. And you find out, I'm already doing all those things. And then suddenly you don't want to do them anymore because of the rules. But anyhow, you have a workplace and your, your boss says, I'm going to give you these tasks. And you realize, I'm, I'm already doing those tasks. And maybe he doesn't know I am, but now they're, they're going to be done and it's all going to be the same. And so this ruler for a moment feels like it's all good because his response as Jesus lists off these things is, I'm doing those things. And then Jesus says, but I've got one more for you. You need to sell what you have and give it to the poor. Because Jesus knew here is the place where he struggles. And again, I'll let you in on another secret this morning. We all have one of these. Some of us have a lot more than one of these. We have several. But there are things we struggle with. And another secret that is one of those uncomfortable reading about the Pharisees moments is we tend to think yours are worse than mine. So that thing I struggle with, well, that's, yeah, it's a struggle, but it's not really that big of a deal. The thing you're struggling with is you really need to get that together. That's a lot worse. And so we will see people in our culture, in our world, that struggle with things that we don't, and we will really come down hard on that, while at the same time recognizing we have our own struggles too. So this rich ruler hears that, and his reaction is not what you hope. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, when Jesus said this, we'll go ahead and read the verse. When Jesus said this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. So we have a God who values generosity and sacrifice. This is what he's being taught through this. Uh, and again, our tendency when we read this verse is to try to explain why Jesus doesn't mean what he's saying. Maybe Jesus actually means what he's saying. The, he does value generosity and sacrifice. And, and when the rich run, young ruler hears this, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. And so for him to sell what he has and give it away, that's a lot of stuff. And he doesn't want to part with it. And we still have a rich ruler. It's the story sandwiched in the midst of all this that really bugs me sometimes. Because so much of what you see when Jesus encounters people and they meet him is their life is changed forever and there's a transformation. And what you have here is someone who walks away sad because this is hard. Now I had a... a conversation with a minister friend long ago that said, you know, I still like to think that the story doesn't end there and maybe that's why it stops here and we don't know what happens from that point forward. Maybe he goes away sad because he knows how hard it's going to be. I don't know. But he's not happy with the answer he's been given. This is not the one he was looking for. And sometimes we find that too, don't we? Uh, 
It feels great those times where we go in and we say, what do I need to do? And you hear the list of things you need to do and it's what you're already doing. Sometimes you will get something on that list that is not what you're doing and you know it's going to be really hard. And again, think to where we began this chapter. Always pray, never give up. So regardless of what it is that comes along, we are capable of doing it. So further in, uh, down to verse 28, Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. So he's heard the story. He's heard all about the, the rich young ruler and what he's supposed to do and sees him go away sad. And he thinks, aha, look at us. Here we are. We don't have great wealth. We haven't done all these things. And so you have the disciples who gave things up. And they did. They, they had livelihoods before Jesus came along and they took a different path. It will lead to the end of most of their lives because of following him. And they did give up a lot. And at the same time, I think by saying we gave up a lot, they kind of missed the point uh, of what this should be. So he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. So we have a God that gives many times more. When you think to yourself, man, I've given up a lot. Or I, I don't really have the the money to contribute this week or the time to do this thing or uh, it's so hard to fit in in our world being a Christian and sometimes, well, if I just let this guard down a little bit and do this thing or that, understand that we serve a God that as he asks of us, he gives to us so much more than he's asked of us. So Jesus reminds them, yes, you've given up a lot, but God is going to give you so much more. Down to verse 35, as he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. So we have a blind man sitting by the road. Uh, I always enjoy the stories about the blind man in Scripture because always something neat happens in the midst of that. As he sits there, he doesn't even know what's happening around him. And so he asks the question, well, what's going on? And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. If you were blind or lame or deaf or whatever it is that you come with this morning, and Jesus were walking by, and someone told you to get out of the way, keep it down, would you listen? Would you want to do that, or would you want to come to Jesus and see what it is that he can do? And for those of us who don't have the physical things that are the issue, if it's the spiritual thing that's the issue, if it's something where you need guidance or help or hope, and you were to come to Jesus and people try to keep you down, what would you do? I love the persistence. And again, we have this theme of persistence sometimes running throughout the chapter. Here's the persistence of this blind man to say, you are not going to tell me to stop calling for Jesus. And so he keeps calling. And Jesus stopped. Notice, by the way, we were introduced to Jesus at the beginning of this story by he was passing by, going through. This was not the destination. Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Maybe that's a good question for us to think about this morning. Just kind of a little aside real quickly. If Jesus were to come to you today, stop what he's doing sit with you. What would you want him to do for you? Because Jesus told us in the book of John that he's actually sent his spirit to be with us. And he also told us, as we learned when we studied about the spirit last year, that having the spirit with us is even better than having Jesus here among us, as hard as that is to comprehend. And I think the spirit would say the same thing to us. What would you have me to do? What do you want me to do? And so he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Now for him, the answer is obvious. But I think for us, it probably is too. Whatever the thing is for you, you know what it is. Whatever the thing you is you need to overcome, leave behind, change in your life, you know exactly what it is. And so if Jesus were to come to you, the Spirit come to you and say, what do you want me to do? It's that thing. So he says, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people. And when they saw it, they gave praise, uh, they gave praise to God. So we have a God who makes people whole. Here's the blind man who has come seeking this one thing, and Jesus says, see. And he goes on, and what is the result of that? It's glorifying God. It's 
That's part of why we're here this morning, because God has done things in our lives we could not do on our own, and our only possible response to that is to glorify him. And we're not going to go through this entire story, but just to remind us of it again. It kind of comes full circle with all this. We see persistence come up multiple times. We see tax collectors and sinners come up multiple times. We see people making judgments on those tax collectors and sinners come up multiple times. Luke 19 begins, that he enters Jericho passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. So we have this wealthy tax collector, kind of tying it all together, isn't it? Because he's going to be persistent. He's going to be wealthy like that rich ruler was. He's going to be small like the kids, I guess. And he's a tax collector. And here he is, and his only desire is to see Jesus and maybe to go unnoticed in the process. But when Jesus sees him and calls him out, what he decides he's going to do is, he, and I think he's probably already decided, and he just lets Jesus know about it, he's going to make restitution above and beyond anything that's required of him. He knows what he has done. He wants to make it right. And down at the end of that story, in verses 9 at 10, it says, uh, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And we have a God who saves. And of all the things we learn about God here in chapter 18 and I guess the beginning of 19, this one I hope is the greatest comfort to all of us. Wherever we've been, whatever we've done, however far we've fallen away, we have a God who wants to save, a God who wants us to draw near. As we read at the beginning of our worship service, because of this, we can then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So this morning, we serve a God who is approachable. This God that we serve wants us to come before him wherever we come from, whatever we have done, however far away we've been. He wants us to approach and to approach, as the Hebrew writer says, with confidence because he wants us to be before him so that he can save. This morning, if you thought God was unapproachable, if you thought you were too far away, maybe you're watching online and you've thought those things, think of what we learned at the beginning of this chapter. Always pray. Always pray for God to forgive. Always pray for God to do what he will do. Always pray for God to give you the one thing that you need to make your life right. And then never give up because the reward that comes is so much more worthwhile than anything we can find here. This morning, if you are not part of the family of God, you can do that today. You can gain that reward that Jesus talks about in this chapter. You can have eternal life with him. You can have so much more than you could imagine here. You can confess his name, be baptized into him, and your life can be changed. Or if you have gone away, know that the God that you have left is still approachable. Know, like we talked about last week, he is not waiting to, to show you what you've done wrong or to give you the I told you so. He is running to you because he wants to bring you back to him. If there's some way we can help you with any of those things, please come while we stand and sing.